Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Thoughtful uh, Thoughtful Faith podcast. Uh, today, I'm here with Dr. Christina Rossetti, uh, and we're going to be having a conversation about polygamy. Welcome, Christina. Hi, thanks for having me. Great. Well, um, I guess we'll just kind of dive right into this. One of the first things I wanted to do in our conversation today was get to know you a little better. So why don't we start uh, first and foremost, uh, and just tell me a little bit about you and your background. Yeah, so I, I'm Christina. Um, I have a PhD in religious studies. I am in the field of Mormon studies, and I say that um, not to be inflammatory and in using the word Mormon, but um, I study groups that come from Joseph Smith that are not the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So I study the fundamentalist Mormons. Um, and I'm a Roman Catholic convert. Uh, so I have no affiliation with the church. Um, and I, over the course of my research, I became really passionate about the decriminalization of polygamy. And I guess that's why I'm here. Awesome. So you actually, you actually grew up, did you grow up Catholic or what was kind of your religious background growing up? Um, I kind of say generically Protestant. Um, mm. I went to Episcopalian school. Um, my mom is still Protestant. Um, my dad's agnostic. And I became, I mean, I've had a million, <laughs> like a whirlwind of religious experience. Um, but I was Pentecostal for a while. I was part of the fourth International Church of the Four Square Gospel in high school. Um, I became Roman Catholic during graduate school. Um, cool. Actually, right when I declared Mormon studies to be my concentration, I converted and became part of the Great and Abominable. <laughs> I guess, according to Bruce R. McConkie. Uh, I'm making him proud. Exactly. So, hey, I did want to uh, also, what, what, what got you into Mormon studies? I mean, if you have kind of this Protestant background and then Catholic, I mean, you've been all around without jumping into Mormonism itself, but that's the thing that you've kind of studied and specialized in. How did that all come about? Yeah, I was really interested in the 19th century and religion in the 19th century. And mm -hmm. uh, the, the professor who became my advisor, she assigned rough stone rolling. And I tell the story quite a bit that I read. I, it's a big book. I'm sure you've seen it or read it. I've read um, it. I read it in 24 hours. I didn't put it. I couldn't put it down. And I became captivated by the story of the restoration and the idea of this community of people that were willing to give everything for this idea. Um, and just captivated by Joseph Smith. And um, I proceeded to read every single book on Mormonism. And it's been eight years. And I still, it's all I do is Mormon history. That's really interesting. I mean, I know plenty of people that get crazy into Mormon history. But that's because they're in a faith crisis and they want to try and find answers to things. So someone coming from the outside to become so fascinated with it, that's really interesting to me. What, what, uh, tell me a little more about that. What, what was it that, that really captivated you that made you read that book in 24 hours and decide to really jump all into this? Yeah, I, the 19th century is a, it's my favorite century. Um, it's a wild time in American religion. Um, I loved the Second Great Awakening, and so I was pretty interested in things mm -hmm. that would have been relating to the Second Great Awakening. Um, but reading, I just, I loved the story of the first vision. I loved the story of these plates that sacralized the American landscape, as John Butler has said. I loved the idea of the communitarianism, um, a full restoration that included polygamy. I thought that was fascinating. Um, Really, all I loved the idea of the temples. I loved all of it. I just I loved all of it. There was nothing that I didn't find absolutely fascinating about it. Um, so one and, thing, yeah. one thing I, I I think a lot of people from the outside they kind of look at Mormonism generally, and they just kind of it's kind of a joke to them. It's not something that they really take seriously. You know, they watch an episode of South Park, and it's just like these people are a bunch of weird kooks that believe in some crazy stuff. And, and, and so, and, and I personally feel like, you know, those people are off for a variety of reasons, but I wanted to get, what do you think people from the outside looking in kind of miss about, uh, 
about sort of the Mormon world, what do you think are the, the, the misconceptions that people have that cause that? Yeah. So I mean, I think it, I think there's kind of two ways to look at that. I think a lot of people maybe who are members of the church, look at the academic study of religion and assume that they're also participating in this bigger kind of mockery of Mormonism. I don't think that's actually true because I mean, I know for me as an ethnographer, so I hang out with people and write about them. Um, my advisors, everyone who's ever taught me has always told me the biggest methodological initiative you need to have is to take people seriously. Like that is a methodology in itself. And so I mm -hmm. think most people who are in the academic study of religion look at Mormonism and realize that you can't talk about um, the colonization of the American West. You can't talk about the construction of the American family. You can't talk about whiteness and race. You can't talk about any of these things in America without talking about Mormonism. Mormonism is fundamentally important to every conversation we have about the history of religion in America, um, I think. And I think most people would say that. Um, outside of that, I mean, yeah, South Park did a good job of, <laughs> uh, of doing what it did. Yeah. Uh, I mean, do I like that episode? I mean, I, you know, it's funny. And hey, I love that. I, I think does, it's funny. <laughs> the dumb, 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 dumb get stuck in my head 100%. <laughs> but um, like they did a good job of what they were trying to do. But and but I don't think I don't I think I think the bigger problem is I think a lot of like the God makers still sticks mm -hmm. yeah. um, with people. Um, and like Lighthouse Ministries, I think that's the thing that has kind of made people not take Mormonism seriously. And I, I mean, in general, I would say, I think that's really unfortunate because I think that Mormonism has offered us a lens to look at so many important topics in the world. And yes, in general, I think that's, yeah. I think people have a perception of it that's very much based on God makers and Mormon lighthouse ministries. And I think that's flawed um, yeah. because it, Mormonism, like any American religion, deserves to be to have critical inquiry about it and to teach us something about well, ourselves I, in the world. And I feel like that that's been one of my my issues is I have gotten deeper into both the history and the theology of our religion. It's sort of like it bothers me that people don't actually take the time to really understand. I understand if you want to, you know, you don't accept it. That's fine. I'm cool with that. But when you don't take the time to actually understand it in in a little bit of depth and like you say take it seriously then you you miss out on what's actually there and there's a lot there um a lot more to it than people realize and the impacts are like you're saying i mean the, the settling of the west was like our the fact that in history books i feel like there's like one paragraph of like oh yeah and the mormons were out there too when i actually studied more detail about what you know, the, the saints did when they came West, it's an incredible story of, of, and it's got politics mixed in and religion and all sorts of other kind of intrigue. It's a story worth telling, regardless of if you think that the church is, you know, whatever you think of the church. And I often enjoy, um, cause it's the story of where I live. I'm in the Intermountain West. And yeah. regardless if you're a Latter-day Saint, understanding the role that this group played within the Intermountain West, like it's, it's critical. It's, it's just super important. And secondly, the, one of the things that bothers me is the incredible, when I've looked at some of the, the, the studies on sort of Mormons as a, as a cultural phenomena, uh, are they healthy for society or not? The overwhelming studies that I have seen have shown that, for the most part, at least, um, there's, there's a lot of good that it does in a lot of people's lives. Now, there are people that will say that it does a lot of harm and things like that, and that's fine. We can have that conversation. But regardless, there's something there to be looked at more seriously, and it's unfortunate that people don't do that. Um, so let, let's let's shift a little bit into polygamy itself, because, again, that's a, that's another one that people don't really take seriously it's just sort of like oh polygamy joseph smith just wanted to get it on with a lot of women that was that it continued and that was it um so i'm just gonna kind of start by stepping back from it and just why do you think polygamy is something that should be taken more seriously than just that just 
that that shallow kind of take that it's a bunch of horny guys trying to have sex with a lot of women. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, for, there's so many reasons. Um, I mean, the base reason, like at its core, the base reason is because people do it. People are living polygamy for religious reasons in the United States. Unfortunately, we don't have great numbers on that because it is illegal and it is criminalized. And so it's very hard to know how many exactly. Um, but it needs to be taken seriously in that is a, it is a religious practice that is not going away. It is a religious practice that your bank teller, grocer, doctor, lawyer is practicing, whether you know it or not, if you live in the U.S. Um, and it is something that has shaped a lot of our ideas about morality, religion, monogamy. Um, and so it matters in a really deep way that you can't, you can't reduce a doctrine. To, uh, this is something that it's, it's a doctrine to people, right? This isn't just, this isn't polyamory. Mm -hmm. These are, those are different things. Um, and I'm really careful when I talk to people about this, that, you know, I'm not talking about secular polyamory. I actually I'm not, don't feel like I'm qualified to talk about that issue. Um, mm -hmm. but this is a doctrine to people. This is a belief system that has the power to make people gods. Mm -hmm. And that in itself is worthy of thinking about in a way that is beyond just, Ooh, I don't like it. Yeah. And what, so going to sort of the doctrinal basis of it, obviously, um, there has been, and I guess I'll kind of give the, cause you, you have your area of expertise in the area of, uh, of kind of fundamentalist Mormons who continue the practice of polygamy, um, within kind of the mainstream LDS church, it is, uh, the idea is that it is a commandment that God has at time commanded in history, but that monogamy is the norm. And we kind of, you know, go by what it says in uh, Jacob 2, where it says, and, and I'll just read it, Wherefore, my brethren, hear me and hearken to the word of the Lord. For there shall not any man among you have, uh, save it be one wife, and concubines he shall have none. For if I will raise up seed unto me, I will command my people. Otherwise, they shall hearken unto these things. And sort of the mainstream interpretation of that is that God is saying monogamy is the norm, but if I will command my people, you know, I may make an exception to this, but otherwise you're to be monogamous. And that's sort of the, the mainstream LDS uh, take on it. And so what is, let, let's explore for a minute, what is the, the fundamentalist take on polygamy, contra uh, you know, when you contrast that with the mainstream church? Yeah. Can I tell you a little bit of the history just because I don't think a lot of your, li maybe your listeners know, but. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so the contemporary lived practice of polygamy that happens right now, um, of course, traces its lineage to Doctrine and Covenants 132 with Joseph Smith and the restoration of all things um, and the restoration of the law of Abraham and therefore the law of Sarah, which is polygamy or mm -hmm. plural marriage. Um, but where the contemporary practice really starts is in 1886. And for a lot of people that might, they might hear that year and be like, wait, but 1890 is when the church under polygamy. So why 1886? Um, mm -hmm. And in 1886, John Taylor was the president of the LDS church. He is in hiding. He is, you know, not like not doing well. He's in, on the run from the government, widespread persecution and prosecution of this practice. And he's in his home, the home of his bodyguard, um, Lauren C. Woolley, who becomes a really big name in the movement. And Lauren, according to Lauren's records, um, Lauren Woolley is sitting outside and he sees this light shining in John Taylor's room. And John Taylor had gone before the Lord to ask about the practice and about what to do because this is a mess. And um, according to the story, which is kind of lovingly referred to as the eight hour meeting, um, uh, John Taylor meets with Jesus Christ and the resurrected Joseph Smith. And he writes down this revelation mm -hmm. called the 1886 revelation, which says it, it doesn't actually say polygamy, but all it says is have I revoked my eternal doctrines. Mm -hmm. And for people who believe in this, they look at this and they look at the context and they say, this is what matters. And according to this story, according to fundamentalists, John Taylor ordains six men. 
And these men were not tasked with overthrowing the church. In fact, Lauren Woolley tells people, do not start a church. The church is the church. It is always going to be here. No, you know, Satan cannot prevail against it. But he ordains this man with what is considered a higher priesthood. Mm-hmm. And that higher priesthood is simply to keep the sealing keys alive, to keep polygamy going to the end of time. It is not about anything else, right? Go to LDS church, be an LDS person, but keep polygamy alive. Um, and so even before the manifesto in 1890, these men believed that they were on a mission from God. Mm-hmm. Of course, you know, 1890 happens, the church stops new plural marriages, kind of. Mm-hmm. Uh, 1904, 1904, they stop new plural, new plural, plural marriages again, mm-hmm. kind of. Um, and what's interesting is a lot of these men who become part of the movement actually end up being sealed to multiple women after the manifesto. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can kind of see the thread of where these people would agree with it. But modern, the modern fundamentalist movement, once again, traces its history to um, the year 1928. Lawrence C. Woolley begins ordaining additional men. And the men who he ordains there are the ones that are kind of right now assumed to be the leaders of the, what becomes the leaders of the movement. So he ordains a man named Joseph Musser, who um, is my favorite of the prophets of the restoration um and his lineage is what is now the apostolic united brethren which is the largest fundamentalist movement in america Mm -hmm. Um, most people know them from like sister wives yeah i was about Um, to say is that uh i'm I'm interested also in knowing because there's not all everyone kind of thinks okay the fundamentalist that's all warren jeffs and there's only like and there's there's a lot more to that so yeah there's how did that kind of play out there's over 400 more groups in the world today. Uh, I know. Shocking. That's, that's much uh, more than I thought. I, I didn't know. <laughs> yeah. So he, so Lauren Woolley ordains these men. They're called the council of friends. Um, and the council of friends are where a lot of these groups come from. So there's a big split in the council when Joseph Musser becomes the president of the priesthood and the head of the council ultimately. And he ordains a man named Rulon Allred. Mm-hmm. And that's, Ordination is controversial. Rulon Allred becomes the leader of what is the Apostolic United Brethren, which are kind of called the Allred group. But that ordination was controversial. Um, a lot of the council didn't agree with it for just a myriad of reasons. And the council splits. And it splits in, uh, in the 1950, 1954. There's a, there's a massive split in this council that had been going for so long. And on one end, Joseph Musser is the leader of what becomes the United Apostolic Brethren. And then on the other end, a man, John Y. Barlow, is who becomes the FLDS. I see. Um, and he ordains um, Leroy Johnson, who's belovedly referred to as Uncle Roy in the FLDS, um, who then, you know, the, the story goes on from there. So in terms of them, with him ordaining um, Roland Jeffs, who ends up, who's the father of Warren Jeffs. Um, I see. But yes, so all FLDS are fundamentalist Mormon, but not all fundamentalist Mormon are FLDS. So it's a lot more common. And from there, I mean, the FLDS has undergone its own factioning um, from the, in 1978, Centennial Park broke off from the FLDS, the Neil, Neil or Nelson group or the third ward broke off from the FLDS. So it's not just prairie dresses. <laughs> And when when you and that was one of the things that was interesting. You're saying the prairie dresses and all that kind of stuff with the Warren Jeffs types, whereas like what, I think one interesting thing was that show sister wives, okay? Because I had never, I mean, I had heard about polygamy, but I'd never really seen like a documentary or something that really, besides sort of this Warren Jeffs thing, that was always the thing. And so to see Cody Brown and his wives, and that it was. Besides the fact that there was one husband with kind of multiple houses that he maybe was going to, it really didn't seem totally like crazy. It was it was yeah. weird. It was weird how much it normalized it. Now, granted, I obviously as a minister of the church have moral right. issues with the practice. However, I also look at it and say it, it was it was interesting to me because I could see how inherently I don't necessarily see in a ton of immorality with this in the sense that, you know, you have people that get divorced. Nowadays we have open marriages. I mean, you have all sorts of things 
th that are like this. And the idea of him being a father to multiple homes, trying to take care of his wives and his children, while I disagree with it on a certain level, on another level, I look at it and go, you know, this, like, let people live the way they want to live. And maybe, and maybe now we can, if you want to, we, we can go mm -hmm. a little bit into the legality side of it. So what are your feelings on the, the legalization versus non-legalization of plural marriage within the United States? Yeah, I do want to mention though real quick that yes, the sister wives, the Brown family, I mean, and there's a lot of families that have gone on TV and done this. Um, I think it's great, right? But on the same at the same time, it made it so kind of every day that a lot of people ended up almost thinking that they were LDS people with just extra wives. Yeah. Yeah. It made it so like it made it so just mainstream Mormon uh -huh. that it it kind of, in some way, I think, um, washed away the very rich history of the fundamentalist movement. Mm -hmm. um, and so people kind of stopped. stopped so they, short so, so the idea, you're saying that it almost made it seem too much like normal Mormonism, quote unquote, the yeah. the mainstream it's, church. Just, just he has some extra wives, but everything else is pretty much the same. Yeah, they're LDS with like another mom, and that's not true. Yeah, and um, there's there's some significant differences, and definitely right. from the mainstream perspective, we want to make sure that everyone knows, like, hey, look, right, that's and not that's us. What I was, but that's, that's what I was just going to say is like LDS people want to tell me all the time they're not us, and I'm like, yeah, well, they tell me all the time they don't want to be you. Yeah. So like, <laughs> lest lest we forget, they think your church is an apostasy. So exactly, both like. Fundamentalist Mormons believe the LDS Church is in apostasy. Mm -hmm. They they too do not want to be you. So I mean, there's there's so much opposition from LDS people to want me to believe that polygamy is not them. And I'm like, I know. Yeah, like, yeah. I'm def never going to tell you that it is you. Um, <laughs> part of a different church. They're part well, one, of. One thing is is that we have, and and to some extent. It's funny, as someone in the mainstream church, it actually bothers me when members want to distance themselves too much from the practice. Okay, it was part of our history. And not only that, to this day, we do believe we do not believe that polygamy is inherently immoral, okay? Right. And wrong as a, a, you know, officially in the church, I don't now there's plenty of more progressive members of the church who basically want to put this in the category of, hey, it was a total mistake. It, it you know, church has absolutely nothing to do with polygamy. This, this it is inherently immoral and they just want to run away from it entirely. Where I I'm not I'm not so quick to jump on that bandwagon if I'm going to embrace a bigger view of my faith, because you have to account for kind of all of the Old Testament uh practices with it. Um, the Book of Mormon does not condemn it outright. It actually says, look, there may be instances where this is okay. So it just doesn't, doesn't, I mean, you have in the Doctrine of Covenants, obviously if you have, uh, uh, you know, talk about it. So it's just yeah. to and me to, to run away from it too much is, is a step too far. And it's, that can, I mean, my coldest take that somehow is a hot take. Joseph Smith did this, right? Yes. Like Joseph Smith inaugurated plural marriage. Come at me. Like I, I don't have patience or time for people who want to tell me that Brigham Young did it. Like Joseph Smith started polygamy. Yes. The it's, head of the restoration. I, I don't, I'm the same way. Someone comes to me and they're like, no, he, he was a monogamous. I'm like, no, like that. <laughs> you have to throw away the stories of like all the Relief Society presidents. Like, are we going to say Eliza R. Snow's a liar? I'm not like, that's yep. not, I'm not going to do that. Um, but that, but also if you throw away what's hard, and I mean, I don't like polygamy, just so that we're clear. I don't yeah, like yeah. it. Neither do um, I. <laughs> but if we, I don't know what I'm saying, we, if one were to throw away 132, you throw away the ceiling ceremony. Yeah. So, and that's for most LDS people, 
you know, the sealing ceremony is. That's the pinnacle. matters. Like that's everything. That is your exaltation. That is your eternal family. That is your temporal family. That's how you become God. That, that's how everything. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to throw away 132, you're going to throw away the ceiling. Like it's, it's, it's hot. You can't disentangle these things. Um, so I get, it. I get the concern with that, even though I, I sympathize with people, of course, who have a hard time with polygamy. Yeah. Uh, especially absolutely. because I've, unlike so many people, I've been in polygamous homes. Like polygamous people are very close to me and dear to me. Mm -hmm. uh, so I get it in a very real way. I understand the problem. Um, but it's, it would be a hard fought process to disentangle Mormonism from polygamy. Absolutely. And I think one of the things within uh, polygamy um, is the, I think people can't get past the idea. And this is just my perspective on it. Um, sort of the sexual aspect of it. And the fact that, you know, how do I, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to express what, what I have, but I want to express it in a way that I, I doesn't come off that. wrong. Cause I, I the, it's hard. Polygamy is tough because you don't want to defend it in the sense that I don't believe that it is something that is the good and what like we want to do. But at the same time, I do believe that it can be justified. Um, as, I do believe. Who has sat in the office of the legislature of Utah to lobby one third, uh, to lobby the new polygamy bill. So we two. I get it. Cause I have sat there and defended polygamy or been the person that is like, let me tell you about the principle. Um, so, so let's, so let's, let's actually look into that then. Let's, so legally speaking, some people have the opinion that, Hey, if I think something's wrong, you know, um, you know, we should outlaw it. This is bad. It, it hurts people. It hurts women. It's, it's terrible. You know what I mean? And so they want to outlaw it. What are your thoughts on those people who want to, uh, outlaw the, pla the practice of polygamy and use the state to stop people from, from the practice? Yeah, I mean, in general, people who are go because I've heard this a lot, right? Um, first, making things illegal doesn't make them go away. We all know that, right? We yeah. all know that. Um, if you're going to tell me that polygamy, you know, should be illegal so that it can go away, I'm going to ask you to similarly defend the war on drugs. I'm going to ask you, there's going to be a lot of things I'm going to ask you to defend that are very similar, right? Because it well, doesn't go away. Especially when it's when it's caught up in religious principle, it didn't go away in our right. religion when it was illegal. Right. <laughs> and it didn't. I mean, it's so. Yes, it it didn't go away. You know, eighty five years it was illegal, and that was something that I talked a lot about it publicly with the legislature and in general is that you know it was illegal for eighty five years, and somehow there are still upwards of fifty thousand polygamous people living in the Intermountain West. So. No, that's not how it works. Um, and it is illegal. It's still illegal in all 50 states. Um, it's decriminalized-ish in some states. And we can talk more about that because in Utah, we it just happened. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's illegal in all 50 states. It's not gone. And so, and that's like, you know, prostitution is illegal. Mm -hmm. Heroin's illegal. There's a lot of things that are illegal and they're not gone. Um, but it does make it more complicated when this is a belief that is central to people's ex eternal exaltation. You cannot take that away from people. Mm -hmm. Good luck. Good luck taking well, that away. I've also, uh, beyond taking it away from people, I've oftentimes worried about um, that, A, it drives it underground. It makes it something that is shady and that has to operate in the shadows, which I don't think is a good thing. I think that that's where you can get worse things happening. Um, and then the other thing about it is, um, you know, I look around and we don't have laws stopping poly like like polyamory. Uh, we yeah. don't have you know people get divorced, they get remarried. They you know I look at I look at all these different. Um, ways that people organize families structures and i can't help but say hey if you have a husband with two wives and he's taking care of both households well and it's part of their religious practice i just can't help but be like why are we 
assuming that, that this is so bad that we need to send guys with guns to go and raid their house and take their children and lock them up. Yeah. So, I mean, I have two thoughts on that. The first is po polygamy, quote unquote, isn't the crime. The crime, bigamy equals cohabitation plus purporting to be married. That's the crime, um, which is slippery in that, for example, I'm going to use this example quite a bit. My dad, great guy. He and my mom have been together 47 years. If he brings a woman into their home and has children with her and is calling her his mistress and is having an affair, great. The minute he says that is my wife, they're felons. That yeah, just makes no sense. And that makes zero sense, right? So you can have a mistress. You can have 70 mistresses. You can have children with all of them and have no legal obligation to those children, no legal obligation to these women, no commitment, nothing. You, it's just free for all, right? Yeah. And that is 100% fine the minute. You say, we did this ceremony, we said these words, exchanged vows, and she is my wife. That's a felony. Yeah, it doesn't make and sense. That's, and that's wild, right? Especially when you meet family. Like, I know a lot of polygamous families that are great families, mm -hmm. uh, that are incredible families, that have husbands who support these women. Um, in a lot of, I mean, people might be surprised to find that in a lot of polygamous communities, women also work. Um, and mm -hmm. a lot of women have gone to school. So the stereotype of them being uneducated and forced into this, it's not always true. Um, and, you know, just good families that are just middle class working families who have men who feel a financial obligation to their children, a commitment to these women who, for those who are interested, have rigorous courting standards, rigorous standards surrounding sexuality. For those who are interested in that, I wrote an article called Further Light Pertaining to Celestial Marriage that is on the sexual practices of fundamentalist Mormons. It's a strict moral code. Um, and somehow that is the one that receives the felon status. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, in doing that, um, it has created a second class citizenry in the state of Utah. It's very hard to get a job if you're a felon. It is very hard to receive access to mental health resources. It is very hard. It's There's a long history of children getting made fun of in school for mm -hmm. being from polygamous families. Um, plig or plig kid has been a long derogatory term thrown at children of these families. Um, and these are just good families, right? Yeah. Who are doing their best to live their faith um, in a very morally rigorous way who believe that they are ardently following Joseph Smith and the prophets. Mm -hmm. And, but like if my dad <laughs> were to have a mistress, like don't Nothing happens. so, so here's a, here's, here's another question. What would you say to those who feel like, well, here's the thing. This practice is a bunch of brainwashing and we as society have an obligation to try and stop people from brainwashing children into these crazy cults. And, and in it, you know, it, the idea is, is society itself should not tolerate people who are uh, teaching these crazy ideas about that you need to, and, and frankly, what many see as sexist ideas, because polygamy goes... Uh, it it uses the pretense of religion to submit women to uh, a situation where they're not going to be happy, where they're going to be miserable. And these men, you know, we've seen cases of abuse. So why do we as society not have an obligation to protect these women and children from being pulled into these unhealthy and wrong relationships? Yeah. So first, um, I hate the word brainwashing because brainwashing removes culpability. You can't look at someone and want to prosecute them for the crime of brainwashing, but also say they're brainwashed because, you know, it removes their, it removes culpability completely. Mm -hmm. uh, but secondarily, um, I want to answer that with a story that a woman that I know from my research who is incredible, who I love her dearly, she was raised Lutheran and has a very Lutheran family. <laughs> And uh, in high school, she took a class on Christian cults. 
I use that. I hate the word cult, but Christian cult. Uh, and she learned about the Mormons. <laughs> and she goes to um, a Mormon uh, LDS singles ward, and she gets baptized. And she goes to BYU-Idaho, and it's great, and she loves it. And then she finds a pamphlet. And she learns about the polygamists. And she kneels down to pray, and she becomes converted to the principal. And she becomes converted to the, quote, higher laws. And she's baptized in a reservoir. And now she's a third wife. And you can't look at her, right? And this woman who was college educated, this woman who was raised Lutheran, completely outside of Mormonism, fully chose this life. Not only did she choose Mormonism, but she chose the principle of plural marriage um, happily. She's still living it. If you're going to tell me about the coercion of women and forcing women into this, I'm going to always counter with that story because that's not the only story I have, right? I've spent enough time with these people to have multiple stories of women who have chosen this completely freely um, that it's going to be very hard to convince me of that narrative. Now, does that mean there's not coercion? No, because for every one of those stories, I can absolutely tell you a story about Warren Jeffs. Um, yeah, and but I would I would say though that even within any religious faith, there are people that are coerced into maybe from family pressure or something to living a way that maybe they in their heart of hearts don't really agree with, but they kind of go along with because right. it's just the community that they're a part of. Right. I mean, the the fact is that both of those stories exist, um, and so that's why we need to have better conversations about polygamy because there are women who freely choose it every day. I know women who, who leave their husbands to go and get sealed in polygamous marriages because they believe in the higher law. Like I know those women yeah. who abandon everything for this principle. Um, but I also know women who are forced into marriages as children. So we need to be able to have conversations about both. And so often we just are unable to do that. Yeah, just because there's a visceral reaction to it from so many people. And frankly, not totally unjustified. I mean, there are aspects to it that... No. And, 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 and this is something that, that for me has been been tough uh, when it comes to polygamy, is that um, I don't... It was actually funny. As I see um, what's... Uh, what is it? the Like Cody Brown and some of these polygamous families and stuff, I, I just came to realize that, you know, this is another lifestyle. I may not think that it's moral, but it also seems like it's a lot harder. Than, and since I got married, since I've been married, I've realized, holy cow, it doesn't make sense if I just want to go and like have a lot of sex some, to marry a bunch of women. There's a, there's a lot easier way to get the milk without buying all the cows. You know what I mean? Like to, to use a terrible example, but, but, but no being, it's like the relate hit, like watching Cody Brown, for instance, in that documentary and some of the others watching the complexities of trying to manage that sort of a family dynamic. Mm -hmm. I'd have to have a lot of faith that what I was doing really was religiously based rather than simply carnally based. If, I was going to continue that kind of a practice because it doesn't look to me like something that I would ever want to engage in. It, it, like some people think, oh, well, men want polygamy oh. to come back. I'll raise my hand and say, having actually seen, I mean, maybe there was, when I was 15, I maybe had certain ideas about something like that. But now that I'm a grown man that actually has a wife, I, and I'm not just saying this because I'm married and my wife will hear this, but I honestly am like, that does not look like something I would ever want to do because it looks like a much tougher lifestyle just to maintain. Um, I don't know if the polygamists feel that way. That's just my take from the outside. Do you feel like most polygamists are living the principle primarily, they feel that it's a sacrifice that they need to make because that's what God wants? Or do they look at it as, this is a superior way of life that I enjoy oh, no. living? It's a, it's a religious doctrine. Um, and it's, it's a calling. Not everyone in the fundamentals movement is called to it. So um, oftentimes people kind of say the polygamists to mean people who believe in fundamentalism. There are fundamentalist people who will never live the principle. I see. It, 
absolutely a calling. Um, and in many fundamentalist communities, they still practice the form of arranged marriage. So that it is um, given by the word of the Lord to the prophet or the president of the priesthood. So it's not, you don't just like decide, like I'm going to have another wife now. Um, placement, the FLDS calls it placement marriage, but marriage mm -hmm. based on the word of the Lord is kind of the standard still in many of these communities. Um, so it is fundamentally understood that not all men are called to this. Um, and if you were to kind of try to go around that, it would be, it would be a problem because it's, there is a level of, pers of worthiness that is assumed to be needed prior to living it. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, you, you don't just get to do it. But the because the idea is, you know, Jesus says in the Gospels, right, that the way is narrow that leads to eternal life. Um, and assumably, you know, salvation and exaltation are not the same thing. And I know an LDS person would agree with that, right? Um, but in fundamentalism, it's a little different because unlike the LDS church that doesn't no longer kind of teaches that the celestial kingdom has different kingdoms within it, um, in fundamentalism, still the highest degree of glory is reserved for those pract who practice the principle in life. Um, and so it's assumed that it's, you know, not everyone gets to be exalted, right? Not This isn't yeah. for everyone. It's yeah. not. And, and so the idea that, oh, it's just a superior lifestyle or everyone has to do. No, there is no false pretense that everyone is going to be doing it or should be doing it. Well, what, one other thing, too, is is do you feel like do they view it, the ones who do practice the principle, do they feel that this is a sacrifice that they are making that has blessings associated with it? Or do they look at it as this isn't even a sacrifice, this is this is an easier way of living my life? I mean, what are, what are your feelings there, how they view it in relation to sacrifice? I mean, of course it's a sacrifice, but you know, sacrifice brings forth the blessings of heaven. Yeah, and that's and that's kind of the thing though. I I and and if it's viewed as a sacrifice, I think that that changes the dynamic to some extent. That they yeah. recognize that this is not something that is easy and for everyone. It is no. something that we have to that is going to be a challenge to live the principle, but we feel that this is what God is calling us to do. Is that kind of the way that they view it? Yeah, that it's absolutely it's a calling. It's a calling like anything. Um I mean, jealousy is real. And if you like, I think, you know, like people kind of see that a little bit on reality TV, but just, you know, it's sister wives is reality TV. Yeah. Um, but jealousy is real in these communities. It's, it's real. And if you know fundamentalist women well enough, they'll talk to you about that. I mean, there's, I definitely know women that um, don't feel that way and feel very, desiring of their husbands living the principle that's mm -hmm. rare i would say um but most women i know would say that you have to deal with jealousy in this counter to that you know a lot of people would then say but men don't and that's unfair yeah what i would say to that is i know a lot of men that two things so i for I've asked a lot of fundamentalist men, are you excited to live the principle? Are you going to do it? I've never had a man say yes to that mm. question, which is important, I think, for people to hear that I've yeah. never had a fundamentalist man say yes when I say, are you excited to live the principle? Yeah. The reason for that is most fundamentalist men grow up in fundamentalism and have seen their fathers have to deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> In a that, way that others that, don't. That was the thing that I felt like when I watched, because I was, when Cody Brown, that whole show came out, I was fairly recently married. And I was starting to understand what marriage is actually is. And then I was watching this show going, this, like those guys see, is there, I was looking at it going, this is a lot different than what I would have thought. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't choose that. Um, Right. You know, it doesn't look like a, an option. And so I just think that it's important that people recognize that simply because it is, um, I think it can change the perspective because you begin to realize that this is a sincere religious belief for some right. people and that this is not some con job. Right. But I mean, but secondarily, women deal with jealousy and we can put, you know, emotional struggles on different levels, but I'm not here to do that. But a lot of men I know deal with that, 
um, there because men in the communities I've seen are cognizant of the jealousy and are and most men in these many of the men I know who are living the principle love their wives, right? I mean, they love them. Mm-hmm. Um, and don't want to cause them emotional distress. Mm-hmm. And so what that has sometimes led to is there are men in these communities that instead of freely giving love, they become very reserved in the love they give because they need to make sure it's equal, right? Because if they show affection yeah. too much or intimacy too much, uh, it could potentially look like favoritism. And so I do know a lot of men in these communities that end up being unable to form intimate relationships with all their wives. And so they completely lack intimate, and I'm not talking about sexual intimacy, Mm -hmm. but completely lack intimacy generally because there is such a concern for creating a situation where it might look like favoritism that they end up not having intimate connections with people at all. And so you can say that one is worse than the other, that jealousy is worse than that. But the reality is I do know a lot of men that have expressed a real grief about an inability to form real connection with their wives because there's so much concern for that. Um, So whereas women experience jealousy, on the other hand, there are a lot of men that do experience really significant problems with intimacy because they can't they can't (laughs) and so it yes you might say that men have it easier um but I would push back on that and say that sure except we forget that the ones that are trying to live this well um have oftentimes experienced that yeah and 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 that's the thing I think when people become so preoccupied with the sexual aspect of it, they think, well, for a guy, that's the greatest thing in the world. And for the, a woman, that's the worst thing in the world. And I think that anyone who's been married, because that's what we're talking about here, we're talking about marriage, right? right. Is that marriage is more than just sex. And there's, right. and, and, and those, re- and that managing that relationship is, is gotta be, you know, super yeah, challenging. In, in- and within the fundamentalist movement, most fundamentalists still retain the doctrine of the law of purity, which is considered the higher law of chastity, which is different. The LDS, the LDS Church no longer teaches the law of purity, um, which at its core is really that sex is for procreation, period. Um, oh, really? And, yeah. And so the... And I, so it, and that, does that, and that varies, that varies from, from group to group within the fundamentalist movement? It's not, it's not universal. Yes. But I mean, Joseph Musser, um, really preached the law of purity. And so a lot of, you know, and then rule and all red really preached the law of purity, but the law of purity was really associated with polygamy. So if you were going to live plural marriage, then it was assumed that you were going to live the law of purity. So the law of purity wasn't taught to populace. Um, so monogamous couples weren't as, you know, taught to live it. But the law of purity generally is that, um, you know, all contraception is off the table Mm -hmm. for these communities. Um, But you can't have sex during um, pregnancy. You can't have sex during um, gestation or lactation periods, um, a lot of them for menstruation. So it ends up being like very small windows and also only for procreation. So this isn't, so the sexual relationships in these communities um, again, people kind of often think free for all. Yeah, um, that's what I was going to say. There's, there's that, there's that. Not, yeah. it's not a free for all in the communities that are doing it. Very, and I mean, you know, we can throw out Warren Jeffs as an example of someone who didn't care about the doctor. Yeah, he office. was. That, he was awful. But the the fundamentalists that you know, are living the doctrine of plural marriage are very often very conscious of the higher law of chastity that comes with the principle. I see. So, so with them, there's even higher sexual norms within this law of purity, but those who don't necessarily practice the law of purity still, uh, one thing is, is like, it's not like all the wives are jumping in bed with their husband all at the same time. That's... No, and there, we, there is a token example of the true and living Church of Jesus Christ, the Saints of the Last Days, or the 
the Harmston group where there was one apostle for a while that taught the three in a bed doctrine. And I just say that to like kind of say that there are examples where um, certain leaders have tried to encourage that. He was excommunicated though from that group. And that's kind of the hallmark example of a leader that tried to do that. Um, but that's really kind of the only one. It doesn't, that's not, that's that not falls happening. outside of that falls out of side of the, the norms of an FLDS. I mean, it's, it's an extreme example. It's like, you know, even yeah. within our church, we got people that'll say and do some really weird stuff, but it's yeah, sort of it's like not, they, you can't use those people as the example of what the movement is about. Right. And I mean, we have to remember too, is that fundamentalist Mormons are generally very conservative in not only their, you know, not only culturally, but in all aspects, they're generally a more conservative, a socially conservative community. Um, so that has to be kept in mind, right? That they don't suddenly become not socially conservative when behind closed doors is that these people for the most part are very conservative people. So let's, let's also, let's take a look for a minute. If you, if, we can at the doctrinal side of it a little bit and sort of their justifications for the principle. Because to me, you know, and I, I don't know a lot about their justifications. So this is a very sincere, genuine question. But the way I view it is, wait a minute, if we had plural marriage you have 50-50 males and females. We have a problem here. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like if everyone lived the principle, we couldn't live the principle. So how do they sort of reconcile this? What is their vision for where sort of the principle fits within the plan of salvation? And and is it, and, and if it's not for everyone, you know, <laughs> Don't you end up creating a situation where there's a lot fewer women out there available to men who want to be married because the the polygamous men went and snatched up six or seven of them at a time? Yeah, I mean, it's not for everyone. Exaltation is not guaranteed to you. <laughs> like, and, that's and, it. And, and I guess... The plan of exaltation is not the plan of exaltation. But why is it that that there are men who are marrying and I'm, I'm asking you from their perspective obviously you and sure. I don't, don't don't have these beliefs but from their perspective how did they justify the idea of um you know men having more i mean when the math doesn't add up you know what i mean is but it it's not supposed to add up right it's not because it's not for everyone and marriage isn't guaranteed to you either okay so the idea is, is like that none of the social ideas that we have about uh -huh. marriage are guaranteed. You are not guaranteed a wife in this life. Uh -huh. You are not guaranteed exaltation in the next life. You're not even guaranteed salvation in the next life. Right. So if it's not 50, 50, fine. But like that was never a guarantee for you. So and that's, that, that sucks. That's hard medicine. Right. Yeah. That's, that's not, that's not fun to hear, but I, have met people who have told me you're not guaranteed a wife. And, and, and that, that, that is true. I, I would agree there. Uh, I guess, I guess it's more a question, even if even beyond the numbers side of it is, um, why is it that the principle is so central to everything? You know what so I mean? I like, like not, I mean, it, that's, what's hard is the fundamentalist movement is about more than polygamy. But if it's if it's the thing that's at the top of the celestial kingdom, the only way you can arrive at, at the greatest, well, highest good is to become a polygamist. That well, seems pretty that. central. I mean, so a few things. So doctrinally, fundamentalist Mormons would are still would still very much talk about exaltation as becoming as deification, as becoming God, mm -hmm. which is something that over time the LDS Church has, you know, started to add becoming like Heavenly Father. The idea of fully becoming God and creating your own worlds is not as talked about in the LDS church, yeah. especially in like meeting houses. So that's kind of a first thing. So every, everyone in a fundamentalist community can be guaranteed salvation. That's not in question, right? That's, that's fine. If you believe in Jesus, if you're baptized, you can be saved and that's fine. Like there it is. Right. Mm -hmm. But to become God. Yeah. That's, 
like even for me who you know is a roman catholic who doesn't right that is a really big deal and i guess why why is do they have a justification for why they believe that polygamy is necessary for that because brigham young said it i see so it does but come brigham down ultimately young said that you cannot be gods, even the sons of gods, without entering into the principle. Brigham Young, that's a quote yes. from Brigham Young. Um, and so they would say, the prophet said it. I mean, that's what that's the answer, is the prophets have said it. Uh -huh. Period. Period. And the They don't, they don't give a, a further rationale for why the prophet may have said it. It's mainly just, it is what it is. Because oftentimes, I mean, that's kind of the next level. I can accept things that the prophets have said, but I also want to say, well, why do you think they said it? Well, so. Like, what is it about they, being because, like God that requires having more than one wife? Because your heavenly father did it. And to be like God, you have to be like God. I see. So it's I mean, the idea that, is, is that that, that is like, the, that is the lifestyle of God. And you yeah, have so to I mean, you have to jump the, into that lifestyle. Thing, is there was this man who he he's a prophet. He was a prophet and he a past, unfortunately, um, of a fundamentalist community. And the first time I visited this community, he invited me into his home. And he was older at the time, like this older gentleman. And I kind of say that when I think of a prophet of God, I kind of think of him because he's like <laughs> this older man with like a bolo tie. Um, nice. And I go to his house and there's this, all this like canned grape juice. It just felt very Mormon to me. And I sat in this leather chair and, or this leather couch. And he was sitting there with his scribe and one of his apostles or his um, son, who's the second elder. And he looked at me and the first thing out of his mouth is he said, Christina, the first principle of the gospel is to know for certain the nature of God, our father and his son, Jesus Christ. That's what mattered to him, right? It was because polygamy is a thing, but the first principle of the gospel is that. And I and I think a lot of LDS people would agree with that because it's yeah the, the same principle, first principle of the gospel. Um, but he needed me to know that that was the first thing. And now, and that's because the biggest thing in the fundamentals movement is that Adam is your God. They still believe in the Adam God doctrine, mm -hmm. and the assumption is that Adam like Brigham Young said, had multiple wives. And if you're going to tell someone they have to be like God, you're telling them that they have to be like God. And God did this. So mm -hmm. that's why polygamy matters doctrinally. And, and it, yes, it gets you at exaltation. But the bigger thing is you don't get to say that I'm going to be like God, but not. Yeah. And I would, I, and, and that that's a good point in the sense that it isn't foreign to someone within the LDS tradition, even the mainstream church, for this idea of becoming like God's means to be like him and to live the lifestyle that he lives. And right. so when you say that the lifestyle of God is a polygamous lifestyle, mm -hmm. that that is the way that worlds are created and populated and, right. and, the, and the plan and continues, is, then it, it, it can make sense. And Adam didn't start it, right? It's an eternal principle. Brigham Young says that Adam brought down one of his wives, Eve, and they took on these bodies and they, they revoked their celestial body to take on a temporal body to do this. Mm -hmm. One of his wives, Eve, and she is the mother of all living of this world, right? So mm -hmm. there's, it, it, and for a lot of LDS people who don't read the Journal of Discourses or don't, you know, have this cosmology anymore, that might see it. Polygamy is part of a bigger cosmology. It's not this, and that's why I say that it's not just LDS people with another mom. It's part of an intricate, bigger cosmology that you have to believe in all parts of it for it to really make sense. Yeah, it has to fit into that bigger picture. Right. Well, you can't have the you can't have polygamy really without the Adam God doctrine. You can't have like these all really go together. And so, and, and let's just, just cause we're mentioning the Adam God doctrine for those who may not be familiar with it, or just kind of heard one time Brigham said this, and that's what I think the Adam God doctrine is. Go ahead. Could you kind of lay that out a little bit and, and give a, a, a quick breakdown of that, that Adam God doctrine? Uh, yeah. So the doctrine, according to um, Brigham Young, and then later expounded on by Lauren C. Woolley and Joseph Musser 
is that Adam is the God, not only that God, God, like the God that we all know, um, is not only the God of your spirit, but he has to also therefore be the God of your body. And so the idea is that um, Adam and Eve lived together mm-hmm. with their, and they walked with their God and that Adam was Michael before, mm-hmm. like an obvious person would argue, um, and that Adam walked with God on his world in Eden. We don't know where that is. Um, and he walked righteously and he died and he attained his exaltation and now he is the God of this world. Um, and so uh, what, what makes, so the Adam God doctrine doesn't work if you think that Eden is like, on, you know, if, you have to ha- have this bigger cosmology of multiple worlds, worlds without end. Um, but he walked with his God who a lot of fundamentalists would call with name Jehovah. Uh-huh. Um, the reason the Adam God doctrine is interesting, I think it's really cool. It's my favorite Mormon doctrine, um, is that it, pos- it posits a unbroken chain of priesthood, that you have your priesthood from God who received his priesthood from Jehovah, who received his priesthood from Elohim, that it posits an unbroken chain of priesthood. Whereas at some point in LDS priesthood, the chain kind of breaks a little bit because you don't have a name for who you got it from, mm-hmm. um, which makes it kind of cool. But it also... We have in LDS cosmology a tangible representation, an example of um, resurrection through Jesus. Mm -hmm. What's cool is the Adam and God doctrine gives a tangible for exaltation that you can kind of talk about what exaltation is like because, you know, Father Adam did it. Uh, And that makes it kind of cool, Mm -hmm. I think. It's not not this abstract, like, what does exaltation? Because when you ask an LDS person, what do you do in an exalted state? it's kind of wishy-washy a little bit. Like I've heard a lot of answers from a lot of LDS people, but when you ask a fundamentalist, what is exaltation like? They're going to tell you that we're going to do what father Adam did. We're going to make worlds. Yeah. And like, that's cool. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. No, it's a, it is, it is definitely a very fascinating kind of take on things because it, it does, like I said, it's, it's hard for me to take things that I don't necessarily believe, but I can also appreciate the vision of it as something that is, wow, that's a really, like, that's a big story that you're telling. You know what I mean? That our world was created by, you know, by Michael Michael to populate the world with his family. And we are going to continue that process if we are able to live that lifestyle. And I, I think that what made me kind of really interested in it is when I was talking to the same prophet and I was asking about the Adam God doctrine and he, in just this very earnest way, thought it was such a outlandish idea that the father of your spirit would allow someone else to be the father of your body. He thought that was just so hmm. blasphemous to think that the being that fathered your spirit would just allow some other man to father your body. He thought that was unacceptable <laughs> that someone would even decide to think that. And when you think of it that way, it's like, Oh, like, yeah, oh, okay. it's <laughs> like, a, that's fair. Well, I, it, it's interesting. You, you've given me a lot to think about and we're, we're kind of wrapping up now. I think we're, we've kind of hit about the time that I wanted to go through but you've given me a lot to think about with this. Um, I, I, do to, I, I do want to mention the Warren oh, Jeffs thing. Yeah, no, no, I was, I, and I, uh, I was going to do that. I wanted oh. to give you some time to talk about any, any other things. And I mean, we don't have to wrap up right now, but I want to make sure that, yeah. that, uh, that, I don't know, first that I just say that I appreciate a lot of this stuff because these are things that as a, and I'm fairly familiar with a lot of polygamous stuff. I haven't run away from it. Like, I'm not one of those ones that's like, wait, Joseph was a polygamist? Like, no, I know that stuff. But I haven't really ever had the time to really understand some of the perspectives of the fundamentalists. And I think it's important that people do that because I think it does help to separate that they aren't all a bunch of Warren Jeffs. And um, we can disagree with them definitely, but to put them all in that same box is just unfair. So you, you say you want to talk a little bit about kind of the Warren I, Jeffs brand. I do. I think that, um, 
I think it's like the elephant in the room on polygamy mm -hmm. always. Um, it's yeah. also the question I get asked. Like if I bring up polygamy, the first response I get is, well, what do you think about child marriage? It's like, well, what do you think I think about child marriage? <laughs> like, I don't like, like, that's just, What's funny is we don't even like polygamy, you and I. Like, I, I think, but, but we can we can talk about polygamy without it just being an emotional conversation. Yeah. Or I mean, people ask me all the time, well, like, what about what about trafficking? Of course, I hate trafficking. This isn't. This, that, I'm not contra, I'm not that controversial. <laughs> um, but I, what you mentioned something that I think is important to talk about is that he, you said that making things illegal often puts things in the shadows. Mm -hmm. um, and we saw that in a very real way with first under the presidency of Leroy Johnson, then under the presidency of Rulin, and then under the presidency of Warren. That, you know, in 1933, um, late President Heber J. Grant of the LDS Church, he kind of signed on to what becomes called the Third Manifesto, where now polygamy is really over. Yeah. Um, and not only that, he agreed to help law enforcement to rid the polygamists of the rid the church to the polygamists yeah the church what's uh, funny is is that people don't a lot of people don't realize that it was the lds church who was the one who came right. down the hardest on yeah. polygamy we were the, like the ones leading the charge and yet people yep. are because we wanted to and distance I, ourselves from the practice and i think that's a problem and here's why because he got got law enforcement involved and at the time and by 1933 a lot of the polygamists had already moved to short creek which um is the historic home of the flds it's on the border of utah and arizona um it's where most people kind of think of as where the polygamists live even though there's really no polygamists there anymore um but he moved them down there and as law enforcement came in as the church was increasingly excommunicating them they became more insular over time. Um, and in exclusion from the outside world became the rule in this community. And the hallmark of that was in 1953, there was a raid where law enforcement entered into Short Creek and took everyone. They took 163 children, threw them into foster care. They put the men in prison. Most people don't realize women went to prison too. Um, it was traumatic on that community. And there's, there's a monument in Short Creek still that has, you know, it says we survived the raid of 1953. Um, and the, but, and for some people who might not like polygamy, they could look at the raid and say, well, good, we're going to get rid of the polygamists. But what the raid did is it reified their belief that they needed to be away from the outside world. Well, so, real, real quick comment on that raid. It's funny because my dad has actually mentioned that to me that it it was something that as he became aware of and it, it, apparently from his perspective, and I'm not super familiar with it, but he said it was kind of like a lot of people had this like, reaction when they saw it. They're like, wait a minute. You're like, these don't look like it horrible, was a evil media people. circus that backfired. It, it backfired because I'm not talking about like a sheriff rolling into town. The Joint Terrorism Task Force was there. ATF was there. Like the FBI was there. This wasn't just like a, a couple cops going into. And it's like it what? Like, because massive. you have two wives instead of calling her a mistress, you well, say that you're the, married to her. I think a lot of people had that same rationale that you did where you go, what in the heck is this? What are you doing? Yeah. The, I mean, the goal of the raid explicitly was to was to save children, was to save the children. Um, now, you know, I have a friend whose grandmother was taken in the raid and she was the monogamist just down on vacation to visit her family. So it was just taking people. It wasn't, it was assumed that everyone there was polygamist. It was assumed that this was a bad place. And so people were just 163 children. Yeah. Many of those children were never reunited with their families. They were thrown into the foster system. It was a disaster. And it did two things. It made Uncle Uncle Roy, the president of the, L, of the FLDS, he looked at this and he said, yeah, we were right. Mm -hmm. That we need to stay inside. Don't, don't talk to the outsiders. Um, and ultimately, what it secondarily did is there was a really significant moment where Warren Jeffs, who was, he was a teacher, he did priesthood history for a while before he became the president of the church. And in his priesthood history class, he taught the raid to children. And he told children to close their eyes and to imagine being taken, being taken from your mother. And he weaponized the raid. 
in a very real way, he weaponized the government. He weaponized the fear of outsiders. Um, he told them, they don't care about you. They've taken your mother. So when fundamentalists don't report crime because they're afraid of losing their children, it's not some abstract fear. They have lost their children. There's a history of this happening. Um, and so my argument is that Warren Jeffs rose to power by harnessing fear um, and harnessing isolation. Um, a really good friend of mine, unfortunately, died by suicide last year. He was one of Warren's kids. And I remember before he died, he told me that he thought that the law was responsible for his dad. And so that's one of the reasons why this issue became so important to me, is it wasn't just an abstract thing of like, I love all my polygamous friends, but like, I've, I've had to bury someone who was affected by the way that his dad was able to rise to power. Yeah. Um, and so I do blame the law for that. But I also, I know these women who don't report home invasion because they're afraid of losing their husband. Like I know children who um, were sexually assaulted, um, not, not from their community, but from the outside world that go home and their mothers say, 911's not for us. That's for your friends at school, but 911 isn't for us because they're going to take they're going to take you away from me. Yeah. And that's not that's not an abstract fear. It's a fear that fundamentalists say because it happened in 1953. Mm -hmm. So how do you how do you look at these people and tell them, oh, report rape? Oh, go report crime. Like, how do you tell a woman to report rape if her mother was taken from her family when she was, you know, nine? Yeah, you don't trust you don't trust anyone in the state or on the outside. And that no. only isolates people further. And then in isolation is where things get get worse. And we have these unintended consequences of of laws that, you know, obviously, you know, you and I could probably have a conversation about how drug laws have caused, some, you know, some problems. Right. And, and I think it's a very complex topic of figuring out what to outlaw and what not to. However, polygamy is one of those ones that for me is very clear. Now, one of the things that's tough is as a, as a Latter-day Saint, if I say, yeah, I want to legalize polygamy, so people kind of sure. look at you like, like, oh, you do. Oh, you do. What do you have in mind? And it's like, yeah. no, I just, I just don't think that. Well, it, you know, it, but it's hard, it's hard for when Utah passed a bill that effectively decriminalized polygamy. It's no longer a felony in Utah. It's an infraction. It's a speeding ticket. Yeah. Um, and polygamous people wouldn't go to the Capitol to lobby their the bill that was going to free them from yeah. being felons because it's terrifying to stand before people that want to keep you a felon. Like yeah. that's and potentially take your kids. They're, they're certainly not going to bring their children to the Capitol. Like yeah. that's scary. I mean, and there have been moments where they have, but the law also in its own way, it made it okay to dislike polygamous people. Hmm. It made it okay to make fun of them. It made it okay to fire them for being polygamous. The law made it okay to continue the stereotypes. Um, I have a good friend who was raised in Short Creek and her mother tried to leave Short Creek. And for many people um, who don't like the FLDS, they might be happy about that, right? This woman's trying to leave. And she goes to the DMV in St. George and the person who's working at the DMV looks at her and says, we don't want you. Because she's wearing a prairie dress and she has the hair and you know she's a stereotype, right? And this woman gets so afraid that she goes back to Short Creek and she dies of a preventable illness. So in some, so the law has created a way in which we force women to go back. Yeah. And I think that's, I, I hope that LDS people uh, within the mainstream church will understand, at least my, my hope, um, as I've kind of looked at this issue, is that there's a lot of things that we don't agree with. But it's a whole nother thing to get the state involved in enforcing something we don't agree with, right? Um, I'm a, personally a believer that the state should only be involved in protecting people's, you know, violations of people's rights. And so I don't see someone marrying an extra woman instead of having her as a mistress, as you pointed out. I don't see that as something that is that needs to have the state involved. Now, does that mean that I morally 
uh, am okay with that, that I think that it's a good thing. No, I don't. I have, I have my own moral opinions. However, there is this idea of allowing people to live the lifestyle and religious principles that they want to so long as they don't harm uh, sure. people directly. So, But do you that, I mean, everyone, everyone says, I'm fine with it as long as they don't marry children. Marrying children is a crime anyway. Yeah. That is a crime regardless of how many wives the guy has that does it, right? That mar marrying children is a crime anyway. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if you're polygamous or monogamous. It's, you can't marry children. Yeah. It's like you can't it's like you can't make murder any more illegal than it already is. You can't no. make marrying children any more illegal. And all you're gonna do is penalize people that have sincere religious beliefs that just happen to be different than yours. Um Real quick before, so as we are kind of winding things down, are, are there any other topics that you think that LDS, I mean, I bet there are many, but uh, in, in this uh, time that we have left, are there any topics that you feel like in relation to polygamy that you want for mainstream LDS people to, to be aware of? Um, yeah, I mean, the big thing that I tell LDS people related to what we said is that, you know, Mormon history, again, not LDS history, but Mormon history is big, right? I, like, well, like I said, there's 400 different groups that call themselves Mormon. Um, and that was surprising to you. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people kind of know the FLDS, they know community of Christ and they know the LDS church. They don't know that the bicker tonight's is the third biggest and it's growing rapidly in the global South. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I would encourage people to learn the history of the Mormons that aren't them. Yeah. Because it's, a wild ride. <laughs> well, it's something it, that it's something that I have not I have not known a lot about, and maybe on another uh, uh, maybe I can have you on another time, and we can actually go into some of the detail on some of those, and kind of go through the wild story of at least some of the the main branches within uh, within that movement. I think that'd be very interesting. Um, what What are your thoughts on uh, how LDS people should react to polygamy? and fundamentalists uh, today? Uh, I mean, fundamentalists are just people. They're just people. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and if you live in the Intermountain West, you know a polygamist, you know a fundamentalist person. If you live in the Intermountain, and they might just be your doctor, right? There's a, there's a long history of fundamentalist men being doctors. Um, if you live in the Intermountain West, you have met a polygamist person. Mm -hmm. period like you, you have and you yeah. wouldn't have known it and they're just like you and so i would encourage people who are lds to live their life as though that is true because i know what is like i know you have i know i know polygamists who are doctors i know uh, that seem just regular clientele who are lawyers who are grocers who are everything mm -hmm. uh, and so i mean I know that we disagree about a lot of things like an empathy or I think it was empathy. I don't know. I think, I think we uh, might've, we might've had some but, disagreements on that. <laughs> and, uh, probably. But I mean, just they are people and live like Mormons in general, members of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints have a long history of persecution and prosecution. Live your life as though the other Mormons do too. And don't become the, don't become the person that prosecutes and persecutes the Mormons, even yeah. though you are one. I agree. And I think that it's important that we recognize our differences, but at the same time, there's a difference between recognizing difference, preaching what we believe to be true and persecuting others. So yeah. well, thank I'm not you. asking, I'm not asking people to like polygamy. Yeah. I don't, that's the thing. Like, I'm like, I don't like polygamy, but I will, I will say that we need to have a level of respect for the practice, both and recognition of it, both within our own tradition, not run away from it. Um, and not to be afraid of conversations about it or people that even today practice it just because someone pra practices polygamy doesn't mean that they're Warren Jeffs. Um, and there is room for us all in this world and we don't need to uh like you said don't need to turn to the people that are persecuting others so 
Well, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. I uh, hope hopefully yeah. I'll, I'll have you on another time when we get into a, a topic related to polygamy and fundamentalism. I, I really do think that uh, maybe one of these days talking about the the history behind some of it, I think could be very interesting because it is yeah. something that I'm only slightly kind of familiar with. So an exploration of it in more detail would be fun. Awesome. All yeah, right. thank you for having me. Not a problem. Take care and uh, have a wonderful day. You too.